up, my chooms and hair loss witchers? Hope you're all still fighting the good fight against the slaphead curse. Remember, a finasteride a day keeps the hair transplant doctor away. So, several days ago, one of my viewers brought to my attention an interesting little video from a gentleman named Eric Berg about hair loss. So, Eric Berg is a professional LARPer who likes to cosplay as a doctor on YouTube. Truth is, though, he's not a real doctor, even though he calls himself one. What he actually is is a chiropractor, which is a practitioner of the proto-scientific medieval dark art known as chiropractic medicine. Truth is, though, is that chiropractic medicine is to medicine what alchemy is to chemistry. It is an outdated pseudoscience that is based on the ridiculous and fraudulent concept that you can cure diseases by manipulating the spine. Not only is it completely worthless, but it's also dangerous as people have become paralyzed as a consequence of overly vigorous spine manipulation. So at best, chiropractic medicine is a waste of money, but at worst, it's outright dangerous to your health. So being that chiropractors like Eric Berg are not real doctors, they are not allowed to practice medicine. Therefore, many of them have turned to the supplement industry to make their fortune because the supplement industry, it's basically the Wild West. It has very few regulations and it allows people to make whatever bullshit claim they want about virtually any product. As such, there is an absolutely huge industry behind supplement sales and it is often referred to as Big Placebo. It's funny how people who cry about Big Pharma ignore the multi-billion dollar supplement industry. Of course, I don't think Big Pharma is perfect, but at least it's regulated. The supplement industry is so lucrative, in fact, that even some real doctors cash in on it, like Dr. Oz. So you can kind of think of Eric Burke as a poor man's version of Dr. Oz, since at least Dr. Oz is an actual medical doctor, unlike Eric Burke, who's just a wannabe doctor. Dr. Oz is just a wannabe politician, which is why he's running for the Senate in Pennsylvania against this guy who looks like a Metal Gear Solid villain. So let me tell you, I'll call a dentist doctor. Hell, I'll even refer to a veterinarian as doctor, but I'll never refer to a chiropractor as doctor because it is a title they do not deserve because they practice a pseudoscience. So Eric Berg, from now on, you are Mr. Eric Berg, not doctor. <laughs> Just because you've learned psycho doesn't mean you've become one. Eric Berg is also a Scientologist, although that's really none of my business. <laughs> Stupid humans. So the video has the extremely clickbaity title of, quote, The number one best tip for hair growth and thicker hair, Dr. Berg, unquote. So that's a very interesting title, but I thought he may have screwed up when posting the thumbnail because he posted a picture of Jello. I mean, surely he doesn't really think that Jello could be helpful for hair loss, could he? I'm going to give you a really simple tip, and it's very inexpensive, okay? Jello. That's right, Jello. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. He's actually being serious. Now, what is Jello made of? Gelatin, okay? Okay. Okay, so what is gelatin? Well, it is a worthless byproduct of the meat industry. It contains the shit found in animals that is too gross for people to eat, like bones, cartilage, skin ligaments, connective tissue, and God knows what else. It isn't a pretty sight. Of course, people like to make money, so one day some asshole asked the question, what if we could just take the main ingredient of soup stock in a children's junk food product and market it as a superfood with miraculous healing and age-defying properties? And it is that question that eventually led to gelatin being heavily marketed as a health and beauty supplement that is popular with bone broth slurping keto bloggers who have a self-diagnosed gluten sensitivity and like to put butter in their coffee. In other words, it's just a new age health fad that gained popularity in the 2010s and remains fairly popular even to this day. So, no surprise at all a fake doctor like Mr. Eric Berg is pushing a popular supplement. After all, he is a supplement salesman. So let's see what kind of mental gymnastic he goes through as he stumbles to convince his gullible keto cultist brainwashed followers how eating literal trash can stop hair loss or help with hair growth. So there's some interesting things about gelatin I want to discuss. It's First of all, it's 99% protein. And it's broken down protein into the basic building blocks, amino acids, and some peptides. Now, what's a peptide? 
Peptide is a small chain of amino acids, okay? So, okay. so to sum up the point Mr. Berg is trying to make, gelatin is collagen, which is a structural protein that is found in all the connective tissues as well as the skin in animals. One of the reasons collagen has successfully fooled people into thinking it is a health and beauty product is because collagen is a protein that gives our skin a firm and smooth appearance, and as you get older, you gradually lose collagen and develop wrinkles. So because of that, a bunch of acid clowns like Mr. Berg realize that they can sell people on the idea that by consuming collagen, you'll improve the collagen content of your skin and look younger. But of course, this is 100% complete bullshit. When you eat collagen, it doesn't get absorbed into the bloodstream as intact collagen. When you consume collagen, it is broken down into amino acids and peptides, which are short chains of amino acids, and then they are subsequently used as energy. So simply put, your body treats collagen the same way it would treat any other protein or food you consume. There is nothing at all magical about collagen consumption, and eating collagen will not improve collagen production in your skin any more than eating an eyeball will improve your vision. That is simply not how food works. Collagen is also found in a lot of skincare products, but these are also worthless because collagen is a huge molecule and it won't be absorbed intact through the skin. If you really want to improve collagen content in your skin, then the best way to do that is by avoiding behaviors which destroy collagen, such as going out in the sun and smoking. Furthermore, even if you could absorb collagen intact, it wouldn't do anything for the hair because our hair is not even made out of collagen. It is made out of keratin, as is our nails, yet collagen is often marketed as a beauty product for your hair and nails, even though it is a completely unrelated protein. It seems almost redundant to bring all this up, but it just goes to show that the theories behind collagen health benefits are wrong on multiple fronts, not just in terms of mechanism, but also even the theory is completely bunk. There is absolutely no science to any of this whatsoever, but why would Mr. Burke care about science? He's a fucking chiropractor for Pete's sake. It would be like trying to explain orbital mechanics to a flat earther. But gelatin has some interesting effects, not just giving your hair, your skin, your nails more protein, but it also increases blood flow. What's that? Did somebody say brute flow? So gelatin is supposed to promote hair growth by promoting blood flow now? Well, first of all, the blood flow theory has been debunked by many people, including myself, and I'll go ahead and link several videos below if you want a thorough explanation as to why hair loss being linked to poor blood flow is absolute Bullshit! But even if blood flow had anything to do with hair loss at all, it wouldn't matter because gelatin does not increase blood flow, and the research Eric Berg attempts to cite to back up his claims about gelatin is about the worst hair loss related research I have ever seen. And believe me, I have seen some very, very bad research on hair loss. But dare I say it, the research Eric Berg cites in the description of his video to back up his claims on gelatin are even worse than that. So, Mr. Berg is basing his claim that gelatin improves blood flow on an article that was published nearly 100 years ago during the Roaring Twenties, so this is not exactly up-to-date research we're talking about. The article looked at the effect on body temperature after ingesting a large amount of gelatin. What's really bad is that the subject in the study wasn't even a human being. It was a dog, and it wasn't a large sample of dogs. We're talking about just one single dog that was being abused by a bunch of humans feeding it loads of disgusting jello. Our spy satellites recorded those images. What is this species? Well, according to the Klinko historians, the species is called dog. Dog. Yes. Obviously the superior race, having the man-animal chauffeur it around. Not only that, the dog was pretty grossed out by it, which is what the investigators noticed when they were feeding him since they said, quote, On three occasions, it vomited during the first or second hour of the experimental period. On the fourth occasion, it retained the food over four hours through the third hour of the experimental period, but finally vomited during the last hour, unquote. So eating a large amount of protein increased the dog's metabolism as well as its body heat, and maybe that's what made it sick. However, it's well known as a nutritional fact that eating any food will have a thermogenic effect on the body, which means raising body temperature as your body metabolizes the food. Protein has a higher thermogenic effect than other macronutrients, but it's not like this would matter. It's not like eating a bunch of protein powder is going to make you regrow your hair because it raises your body temperature. As a matter of fact, this 1926 article doesn't even mention 
mention blood flow at all. According to Mr. Berg's source, the increase in body temperature was thought to be caused by an increase in peripheral blood flow, but to support this, he says, quote, this hypothesis is supported by an article in which finger blood volume was found to increase following gelatin ingestion, unquote. But then he does not even supply what article he's talking about. It was probably something the great Lord Zeno whispered to him in his dreams. So this blood flow theory behind gelatin is totally unsubstantiated. He just thought, hmm, gelatin raises body temperature, so that must increase blood flow, and blood flow stops hair loss, right? That would be like claiming going to the sauna or taking a hot shower is going to improve hair growth. Unfortunately, though, this is the high point of the video, and it's going to go all downhill from here, believe it or not. And as far as peptides in this gelatin, there's one called hydroxyproline which has uh, been shown to actually increase hair growth by itself. So here he mentions the amino acid hydroxyproline, and he claims that it has been shown to improve hair growth even by itself. He doesn't provide any sources for this whatsoever, so I did his job for him and found out that he's maybe just partially correct. You see, derivatives of hydroxyproline have been shown to promote the growth of hairs, but the hairs we are talking about are root hairs of the plant Arabidopsis thaliana. So I suppose that's good news if you happen to be a plant, which in this context is appropriate since Mr. Berg and all of his fans are brain dead vegetables. Interesting studies, I'll put them down below. Uh, a lot of these studies are double blinded, placebo controlled, clinical trials um, between the years uh, 1983 and 1998, but I did not search for studies recently. Well, let me go ahead and save you the trouble here, Mr. Berg, because I went ahead and searched myself, and I can assure you they don't exist. But let's go ahead and take a look at the specific studies Mr. Berg does cite. Well, first of all, his main source is this site here, which looks like one of those pop-up ads you saw on porn websites from the 2000s, which were loaded with malware and viruses. In fact, if you click on the download link, you get other pages which look even more dangerous than that. I felt like I was entering the dark web. Anyways, on this source, he shows a slideshow dedicated to a deceased Israeli dermatologist named Dr. Zeev Pam. This doctor is notable only because he apparently devoted his entire life to gelatin as a medicinal product. So that seems kind of weird, but to get to the point here, this Dr. Zaev Pam, or Zeev Pam, provides a table summarizing studies on gelatin. A big problem with the study, though, is that if you try to track down these studies, you'll find out that they're so old they're not even available online. Furthermore, some of them were not even published studies. Rather, they were just presentations at medical meetings that were not peer-reviewed and not even published at all. For example, this study from 1982 combined gelatin with the non-essential amino acid cysteine, and this was given to 40 volunteers and compared to a placebo. This table shown here seems to in indicate improved hair growth. However, if you search for this source on the internet, you end up just getting a link to the same set of slides that I'm already showing you here. The other two studies he cites are a 1982 study that was, quote, accepted for presentation on 16th intern Congress of Dermatology, May 23rd to 28th, Tokyo, unquote. So that's after 40 years, and we're still waiting for this study to be published. And you guys think that pyrolutamide research has taken a long time. And the other study is an Italian study that has been lost forever in some black hole in the internet, or maybe it's on Hunter Biden's laptop. Well, most likely, what happened is that people abandoned this crap long ago because in the following years, we've learned enough about hair loss to realize that this gelatin thing was just a dead end and no actual research would take it seriously in modern times, and that's why Mr. Burke is a chiropractor and not involved in any real science. So, the other sources in this slideshow are similarly obscure or unpublished. The most recent study was from 1998, in fact, and you can see this graph here, which supposedly shows improvement in hair growth with gelatin, as well as with gelatin gelatin combined with cysteine and saw palmetto. But you can see that although there's been plenty of time to get this data published, it never happened. And all we have to go on this is an abstract that was presented in Singapore in 1998. Similarly, Dr. Zeev Pam's data on gelatin and antric alopecia, as well as telogen effluvium, is based on studies that never got published. One of the studies is just a lecture that Dr. Pam gave in 2010. So Dr. Pam's lecture was published, but you can see here that it's just his anecdote experience as a dermatologist where he says he used gelatin a lot and it worked for his patients, but he doesn't present any scientific data with proper controls put in place to validate any of these claims. In fact, 
He's even financially biased towards gelatin because he made a patent on a gelatin-based remedy which he marketed for hair growth. So there is a clear conflict of interest here, which may be the reason this crap never got published as a full article in a medical journal. So none of this is good scientific evidence that gelatin does anything for hair growth, and in fact, it's a stretch to even call it scientific evidence as this was just a blind alley and nobody has seriously pursued gelatin as a cure for hair loss since 1998, and why the hell would they? It's just a fucking food. And food is not medicine. That's significant. For three different conditions, seborrheic alopecia. Seborrheic alopecia? He's trying to say seborrheic alopecia, but this is a misleading term. It is a term that is mistakenly applied to hair loss from the condition called seborrheic dermatitis, which is a skin disorder usually caused by a fungal infection that results in itchiness and redness. Severe seborrheic dermatitis by itself does not actually cause hair loss, but rather it can influence behaviors which can cause hair loss. Specifically, the extreme itchiness of seborrheic dermatitis can cause excessive scratching, and this mechanical tension can pull out hairs leading to temporary hair loss. So seborrheic dermatitis can indirectly cause hair loss, but it isn't by itself a causative factor, which is why the term seborrheic alopecia is misleading. Now in this video, I'm not going to get in the specifics of each one of these, but apparently gelatin just gives you the raw material and also the blood flow to help add some help to this problem. So according to Mr. Berg, gelatin works by helping to add help to the problem of hair loss by adding gelatin to your hair to add raw materials and blood flow to your hair even though there is no gelatin in your hair and there is absolutely no evidence at all that it increases blood flow or that blood flow even has anything at all to do with hair loss. The only thing this video proves is that Mr. Berg's brain is made out of gelatin. And in some of the studies that I'm gonna list down below, they didn't just use gelatin. They also added with it L-cysteine, okay? Okay. You can also get L-cysteine in another product called NAC. And they added some salt, palmetto, which is also good for the hormone uh, component part of hair loss. So apparently gelatin isn't even all that great, since in some of the studies they had to add L-cysteine as well as salt palmetto to the formula. So what is L-cysteine? Well, it is a non-essential amino acid, which means that the body can produce it by itself if you don't eat it in food. There is a related chemical called N-acetylcysteine, or NAC, that is an antioxidant, and I did a video on NAC that I'll link below. But the bottom line is that the evidence shows that NAC might have some minor effects on hair growth, though the data is not particularly strong. L-cysteine also has an antioxidant effect. This article here reviewed over 126,000 publications on L-cysteine and NAC, including including 1,638 clinical trials and concluded that the effects of L-cysteine on human health in general is a bit of a mixed bag. You see, although some of the studies showed health benefits, the authors of the article note that, quote, negative effects of L-cysteine derivatives on human health have been reported, unquote. These negative effects include damage to the kidneys and nerve toxicity, so taking large doses of L-cysteine isn't a particularly good idea. When you look at L-cysteine and hair growth, the article cites as evidence one study from 1990 written in German that showed benefits on hair growth, but the researchers didn't actually use pure L-cysteine. They used something called Pantogar that also contains a lot of other things besides L-cysteine like B vitamins, yeast, and keratin. It isn't possible to obtain the original article online, but the authors are from Germany and Pantogar is made in Germany, so I wouldn't be surprised if this wasn't a study sponsored by the makers of Pantogar. In any case, the subjects in the study didn't have androgenic alopecia. They had something called, quote, diffuse effluvium capillorum and angogenic structural alterations of hair. Well, I don't know what the fuck any of that is, but it certainly isn't androgenic alopecia. So I don't know why researchers would test this product on such an obscure cause of hair loss, but certainly this is not strong evidence. And even if it were credible, it isn't even being studied for androgenic alopecia. So for all we know, this product is completely worthless. Anyways, 
As the European Food Safety Authority concluded in 2010, quote, the panel concludes that a cause and effect relationship has not been established between the consumption of L-cysteine and L-methionine alone or in combination with maintenance of normal hair, unquote. So what about saw palmetto? Well, saw palmetto is the closest thing Eric Berg comes to bringing up something that has a legitimate mechanism in fighting androgenic alopecia. Since like finasteride, saw palmetto is a 5-AR inhibitor, which is the enzyme that converts testosterone into the trash hormone DHT, which causes hair loss. The problem with saw palmetto, though, is that in order for a 5-AR inhibitor to stop hair loss, it needs to reach a certain threshold in DHT suppression, or else it really is an all-or-nothing equation. What I mean by that is that if something suppresses 10% of scalp DHT, that is going to be just as worthless as something that suppresses 0% of DHT. You need at least about a 30% decrease in scalp DHT before you see any significant increases in hair counts, and I discussed this in my dosing videos on dutasteride and finasteride, which I'll link below. So saw palmetto, unlike gelatin, at least has a mechanism that makes sense. But this is a good example as to why mechanistic data is not good enough and is often exploited by supplement salesmen like Eric Bird in order to try to make a health claim about a fraudulent product. You need human data to confirm if a theory translates into outcomes, and sadly, saw palmetto is simply not strong enough to be effective. There are other natural supplements that work as 5-air inhibitors on the market as well, such as reishi mushrooms, which again, has a similar mechanism to finasteride, but it is also not strong enough. I'll link that video below if you're interested in learning about how such supplements don't measure up to FDA-approved pharmaceuticals like finasteride. So anyway, I wanted to keep this video short and just give you a simple tip. Well, thank you for that, Mr. Berg, because your content is fucking unbearable. So I'm grateful you kept this video mercifully short. But please, never talk about hair loss again and stick to what you know best, which is making exaggerated claims about the keto diet. When it comes to talking about hair loss, you simply do not know what you're talking about. You are out of your league here, sir. While you were still learning how to spell your name, I was being trained to conquer galaxies. So until next time, good luck on the path, my fellow hair loss witchers. God bless.